Okay, it's two o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. So today the, the topic is um, Carol Dweck and her work around fostering what's called a growth mindset. She is um, one of my favorite contemporary psychologists because her work is, to my eyes, so immediately practical. Uh, and Teresa Partridge from the psychology department is going to get us started. Teresa, you ready? Yes, I am. Um, can I share my screen? So um, I'll just go ahead and get started and just go uh, step by step through this. Um, we're going to talk about uh, promoting growth mindset. I'm going to share some of the things that I've done um, in class, but of course that doesn't fit everybody. Um, but I do love talking about this, and I talk about this in most of my classes, uh, especially child development and social psychology, because in those things we cover uh, self, and part of self is uh, the beliefs we have about self, the beliefs we have about theories. Uh, so an overview of this is that we're going to talk about fixed versus growth mindset and research on how beliefs shape our learning. Um, and how we can help our students to have a growth mindset, especially if they're learning online, it, which is, I admit, a little bit more challenging. Okay, so a lot of this research has been, been done by Carol Dweck, and you'll see her picture on the next page. She was interested in uh, understanding more about why um, some people are resilient and will just really go at those challenges and other people um, just give up easily, uh, believe they can't accomplish something. Uh, so she believes that their beliefs, or students' beliefs from all ages about their intelligence will relate to how motivated they are in classes, um, how they study and how they seek out our help, whether they're willing to ask us for help or if they want to kind of protect self and not show us that um, they're having problems in that area. Responses to challenges and setbacks and academic achievement in general. So here is our picture of Carol Dweck. Um, and she has written a book, uh, it's, uh, has had multiple editions now, called Mindset, the New Psychology of Success. And there, there's very few people that I will stand in line to get an autograph from, but I do have, I don't know if y'all can see me, but I do have my copy and I do have it autographed. So um, I am a big fan of hers and I enjoy hearing her speak when she's at our conferences. Um, because I too have to remember over and over again that we can still grow, we can do better. Um, so according to her with this fixed versus uh, growth mindset, uh, if somebody has a fixed mindset, then they believe that intelligence is fixed. It can't be changed. They're only as smart as they're ever going to be. Um, if they have a growth mindset, though, they have more of a belief that they can um, accomplish more. They can work harder to do better. Um, and all of us have had some of those students that uh, probably did really well in high school and they come to college and they're confused by why they're not doing as well and they may get uh, discouraged and not do as much uh, work because of that. And then we have those other students that just show that grit, that really uh, are excited about learning, they're willing to work, they come to office hours, they ask for additional information, they may even be emailing us information we didn't know from links that they've seen. Um, so we have those uh, kind of two different things. When I ask my students about this, when I teach them uh, about it, students often have a mixed mindset. Sometimes they have a growth mindset, depending on the topic. Other times they have a fixed uh, mindset. And I think it sometimes goes with which classes they enjoy more um, and which ones they've done historically better at. So these mindsets are the lens that students are using to look at themselves um, and it determines the behaviors that they're going to choose to engage in, especially when it comes to academics and college classes. We have a lot of students at our university that are first time um, students, are first generation students, um, or they are coming back to school after years of being uh, out of school. And um, it 
matters how they're going to perceive doing well in that school. If they are pulling some of those uh, beliefs about self and their motivation because, oh, well, I'm first time or first generation student, that's going to affect how well I do. Um, and we really want them to understand that they can continue to grow. So here is one of the examples I use in my class. This particular example was with um, seventh graders and Dweck did this research. I think this one was published maybe 2007. And um, it was with junior high kids and the kids came to the class and uh, they were gonna learn a physics lesson for this particular uh, research study. Um, first, they measured, uh, the researchers measured it, whether they have this growth mindset meaning that they like to uh, think of it as learning, that they can learn, or a fixed mindset, which is often associated with them doing well on something just to perform well, just to show, see, I did it. See, I'm smart still. Um, so first they did that. Then they gave them a test, which actually was kind of this bogus test um, on physics ability. Uh, they randomly assigned them to get positive feedback or negative feedback. And the students that are performed, um, well, had more of a growth mindset, um, it didn't matter if they were told they had a high ability or low ability. At the end of the lesson, when they were tested, they did well on that test. So they still put forth the effort, even if they were told they had low ability. For the fixed mindset group, if they were told that they had um, a, a lower ability, they tended to just give up. Well, I'm not going to be good at this, so I might as well just not pay attention and not learn. If they were told they were, had a high ability, they still, get, still did good. So that's the basis of a lot of the different research that has been done. And like I said, she's done this with uh, multiple age groups and with college students as well. Even in college students that historically are at risk, she has shown that um, just by teaching them about growth mindset in a certain way, it could help them learn and do better. So what are some of the consequences? Sorry about that, that's gonna drive me nuts not being able to show that. Um, what are some of the consequences of believed? Um, one is what their goal in school is. So if they have a fixed mindset, they want to look smart, especially if they've already been told they were smart over the years. Um, if they have a growth mindset, then their goal is to learn and to understand the material. It's a difference between performance versus mastery. Uh, they either want to perform or they want to um, master or really understand the information. So let me go. Okay, so on this one, um, if they want to look smart, they may say something like, the main thing I want when I do my schoolwork is to show how good I am at it. Um, and then if they do poorly on something, then they kind of shut down. If their goal is learning, it's much more important for me to learn things in my classes than it is to get the best grades. Um, so we really already kind of set students up for this fixed mindset with the way that we grade. I don't, I've never figured out a way around that. So I uh, don't know how to deal with that, but it would be nice if we could encourage them. The learning is the important part. Okay, so what is uh, their values with regards to effort? Do they value putting forth more effort and working harder if they um, have a particular mindset? And the research has shown that if they have a fixed mindset, then they do not put forth as much effort because then if they work hard and they don't do well, that affects their self-esteem, that affects their evaluation of self. So they may say something like, to tell the truth, when I work hard at my schoolwork, it makes me feel like I'm not very smart. Um, and if they have a growth mindset though, then they do want to put forth that effort to do better. If they fail an exam, then they realize, okay, I need to work harder, I need to go to office hours, I need to do more. And they may say something like, the harder you work at something, the better you'll be at it. Okay, so for the last one, reaction to failure. Um, 
they tend to have more of a helpless reaction to failure if they have a fixed mindset compared to the growth mindset. Uh, they'd say things like, I would spend less time on this subject from now on because I'm not going to get a good grade anyway. I would try not to take this subject ever again. I'm going to avoid classes in this particular department as much as possible. Those are the kinds of things that they're thinking if they start developing this helpless motivation. If they're more resilient, uh, though, then they believe that they can get better and I would work harder in this class from now on. I would spend more time studying for this test. So one of the things we can help students with is to understand that that first exam is not the end, um, that there's a lot more that they can do as they go through the semester. Okay, and then finally on this page, it talks about the achievement that's associated with each. So with a fixed mindset, they tend to have lower achievement. One of the problems is they don't wanna put themselves out there. Like I said, it's a, a, a self-evaluation issue. If they have a growth mindset, often they'll have higher achievement because they do continue to work harder and put forth that effort. So can we change the mindsets? Yes, that's the good news, is that there's been lots of research that shows that we can do uh, different things to help students with their mindsets. One would be these uh, kind of workshops that are available, and at the end of the PowerPoint, and I'll provide you all this information if you want it, um, this particular uh, PowerPoint actually comes from the website that was... Uh, a program developed with Dweck and others to help educators, help parents uh, develop that growth mindset. And it includes information on how we can best help uh, students um, or anyone to develop that mindset. With these interventions they've done through research, they have shown that uh, students can change in their performance uh, following a growth mindset workshop or program. In this particular study, uh, with students in the control group is the yellow line, and students receiving the growth mindset program was the green. And you can see before the program, they all were relatively equal. And then after, there was a real big split between the two, with the, uh, those that were in the control group that did not get the mindset help, um, decreased in performance, whereas the ones in the growth mindset program increased in their performance. Another example, I don't have to pull this one up. This was, oh yeah, this was underperforming high school students going through that same kind of program. And again, they showed that their performance increased or was better through that. Okay, so how do ev everyday interactions? One of the things that we can do is change the language that we use um, and emphasize the effort rather than how smart they are or how intelligent that they are. Um, and this goes for kids as well. And uh, I kept trying to use this with my own children and I'll let you know if it, how it works. They're all adults, they're both adults now, but. Um, I have a quote from one of them a little bit later. Uh, so the language that we use and what we say to them about the amount of effort they put in versus how smart they are can change uh, up how they respond. So here are some uh, helpers. Don't focus on um, things that might be stable, such as talent or intelligence. Instead, focus on things that are, um, can be changeable with effort. So strategies that are used, um, I like how you tried a new way to solve that, um, or improving over time with practice. For instance, if you have a paper that uh, they're working on throughout the semester in pieces, we do this in research methods where we have uh, different sections that they're going to do, um, comment on how they've improved or that they're getting better. Um, even reflection papers throughout the semester, uh, if they kind of get that feedback that I can see you put more effort into this, then that might help them to put even more effort in going forward. Uh, look at mistakes as being challenging, uh, challenges that they're facing. Yeah, that was really challenging. You don't quite have it yet. So rather than focusing on now, uh, focus on the not yet. Uh, you're still struggling with it, but we can work on this and you can do better. 
Okay, so, um, and actually I remembered what I was gonna say about this other, uh, uh, the, the, let me go back to this real quick. So the, in this particular study, one of the things they did, and one of the things that's available to everybody on this uh, mindsetkit.org is um, understanding how the brain works and how the brain is plastic. So we call it neuroplasticity, meaning that through learning, we are forming more and more connections between those brain cells. And this provides a really nice um, way of explaining to students how they continue, to, they can continue to grow, they can continue to get better because the brain is uh, moldable or malleable. Um, it can be, uh, changed with effort, with the environmental influences. So that was one of the things that was included in this uh, research study that was published in 2015, uh, was looking at uh, or talking to students about neuroplasticity and also explaining the research on growth mindset. Just telling them about growth mindset, saying, hey, you can grow, you need to have this motivation, that's not enough. They have to understand that, no, this is actually supported, this, this can work. So that is one of the things that you also can present to students or have them do a little mini workshop online um, to get the idea that they can do better. Uh, we don't all have that time to do in class. I'm lucky because I teach psychology, so it's built into my uh, classes. Okay, so some of the uh, suggestions came from uh, fostering online student success in the face of COVID-19. This was uh, an article published as kind of a blog in scholarly uh, teaching, I believe. And uh, so you can find this online. But uh, they used Dweck's ideas about uh, growth mindset and suggested three main ways that we can help out our students. One is by creating a psychological safe by being there for the students uh, so that they're safe in this learning environment. Uh, and I'll go into the, each of these in a little bit more detail. Another is demonstrating resilience. Um, so showing that, yes, everybody goes through some tough times, but we can come through these things. And then inspiring the players. So let's talk a little bit more about each one of these. Creating psychological safety by being there for students. Um, one suggestion was to have regular Zoom meetings where students have to turn in on their audio and their video. Um, it provides a chance to check in with them. That only works if we're teaching synchronously. So um, a lot of us are teaching asynchronously, so we're not, uh, we don't have a particular time where the class comes together. We could set up study groups on Zoom to have a kind of uh, match up sometimes with them. Um, or we can even try to check in individually with students when possible. Um, so the asynchronous takes a little bit more um, outreach, more emails probably to try to keep them engaged. Um, another thing that's important is to invite all voices. And in my classes, when we're face-to-face, -face, um, it's much easier to get students to answer questions face-to-face -face than it is online. Uh, but when I have met with them for reviews on Zoom, I still try to encourage the um, idea that it's okay to be wrong about an answer because you'll probably learn that material, material even better because you were wrong and now you've corrected yourself. So that immediate feedback kind of idea. Um, the other thing is if you're having just a discussion in general, then there is no right answer. So people can bring in uh, their different views. When I teach uh, social psychology, I uh, have to really work at providing a safe place because we're going to talk about things like prejudice and discrimination and conformity and a lot of different issues that um, students are sometimes nervous about saying what their opinions are and everybody has them. Uh, so you, we have to work even harder to provide that safe space for them. But by providing that, that means that they still have a voice and they can use that voice to present their ideas and that it's okay to do so. Um, another thing that we could do online if we have students that suddenly disappear, which uh, I had several this semester, um, and emailing them directly 
encouraging that re-engagement that, okay, yeah, you've missed a couple of assignments, but we're still okay. This, you can still learn this material. We can still go forward from here is another idea that uh, can be suggested for that. Um, another thing that was uh, brought up in that article that I read was demonstrating resilience. And this means it's okay to talk about our own personal failures and how we dealt with them. Then students see us as, oh, this is a real person. This is a person that has uh, dealt with failures. It's okay that I didn't do well on that test in front of this person because they also have faced difficulties. My usual example is uh, Spanish classes because uh, I have taken, I've actually taken two years of Latin, two years of French. I've taken multiple first section uh, Spanish classes throughout the uh, years and I still struggle with it. But I tell them I still keep trying. I bought Rosetta Stone lifetime membership recently so I can try again. Um, so they usually find that funny because a lot of them are bilingual. Um, but admitting our own mistakes, if we forgot to put an assignment up or a date up, then, you know, yeah, we're, it's a hard time for everybody. We're all working on this online situation. It's okay. Uh, so providing that kind of idea that nobody's perfect, it's okay that we make some mistakes along the way. Um, also, you could give them examples of uh, asking them, well, what would you do in this kind of situation, which would be good for discussions, uh, discussion boards as well. Um, so somebody makes a mistake how they how should they proceed how should they go forward and if you put that in terms of growth mindset then you give them that chance to think about how can we do this and do better and understand more about this uh, material okay and then the uh, last one from that article inspire the players um, emphasize effort and provide opportunities for growth was one um, suggestion. For instance, um, I give students uh, an opportunity, like I said, these are just examples in, from my own classes, uh, but in one of my classes, they have the opportunity to take the comprehensive final if they choose to. So if they did really bad on one exam, they can still take a test. It, it encourages effort because they have to study the entire semester, Just rather than just the sections, but they can replace their lowest grade and count it for their last exam. So it provides them opportunity to do better. Uh, other examples would be uh, if we have those papers where there's different sections, we provide feedback, allow for revisions, uh, and uh, increase how many points it's worth as time goes on. So they're continuing to have to put, more, uh, put forth more effort through the time. Um, so th this was the thing that I mentioned that I, so I asked my daughter because she's uh, graduated from Baylor, so she's done with school for now, and I said, what was it, that, what were the things that encouraged you to have this growth mindset uh, through that time? And her response was that she worked harder in classes when she felt a connection to the instructors. So when there was that relationship there, it, the motivation was more there that, oh, I can do this. My instructor believes in me. They believe I can work harder and I can do better. Okay, so some other ideas, um, formative assessments, where students have uh, the low stakes quizzes along the way to see where they're at, or playing games like Kahoot to see, oh, I really need to study more because I didn't do as well on the Kahoot game. That's a trivia, an on online trivia game. Um, providing encouraging feedback on assignments and assessments. Uh, for instance, we can send out an email after the first exam explaining where things are with other students, so like give an average for the, uh, for the class, but also to encourage them to understand that this isn't the last thing that we're going to be doing in this class, and everybody has a chance to bring up their grade. Usually um, after my second exam, I tell them that all students still have a chance to get A, B, or C, so everybody has a chance to pass still, um, and so we can still keep working harder, and I always offer them if you would like to meet with me individually, then uh, we can talk about ways for you to uh, do better, to do, do well in the class and to uh, promote better study 
habits and understanding the material or going over the material. Um, okay, I mentioned the second chance I give for the exam, so that's uh, encouraging growth. And uh, dividing large projects into smaller pieces with feedback so we can provide formative feedback along the way. And one thing with online classes that I think is really crucial is the organization of the class. If they have difficulty finding their way around Blackboard or Canvas, then they may have more difficulty with the class overall and get discouraged along the way. So when we organize it according to Quality Matters uh, standards, then we're also helping the student get through uh, the material and find the things they need to find, such as the quizzes, the discussion boards, a list of assignments, um, anything that will help them uh, do better in that. Okay, so this is the website I was telling you about, mindsetkit.org. They provide a lot of free resources and uh, it's produced by um, Stanford University in general, but uh, Dweck has had a hand in creating uh, these materials and working with these materials. Okay, any questions, comments, any suggestions for uh, helping with mindsets that y'all know of? I don't know if anybody's been chatting, so. Yeah, there's been a bit of a chat going on about video and bandwidth issues. Yeah, the bandwidth is definitely a problem. I've run in, into that as well. Um, and that is, yeah, that's going to cause more difficulty. So I usually let students, I mean, they, they don't absolutely have to do video. Um, it's not a requirement, but I just encourage them. And the more I encouraged it, the more they actually were doing it. I was kind of surprised. Yeah, I kind of found also that um, if I could get people's toe in the water by a thumbs up gesture, a chat response, something like that, that the camera came on a little bit later, you know, that uh, it seemed less scary, I think. Have you had any of that experience, Teresa? Um, yeah, I tried that with some of my classes. I'll be honest, when I uh, was, I was teaching asynchronously this last semester, and I would sit there alone in Zoom classrooms through Blackboard a lot. Mm -hmm. And I sent them messages even saying, hey, I'm just hanging out. Um, anybody <laughs> come on by, we're good. Uh, I, for reviews, they'd show up. But uh, then I started, uh, like I gave them extra credit one time to show up so we could just have a conversation. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's hard to require it because of mm -hmm. the asynchronous nature, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. You know, I think another thing to think about is uh, a little bit about course structure. Uh, for instance, um, on my first test, I usually expect students to do badly, and a fair number of them do. Um, but I've sort of built in a little second chance thing. Um, I know from the beginning, I'm going to give everybody an extra credit opportunity to earn five more points. So I've built it into my grading. I'm not giving away the store. Uh, but people have an opportunity to learn real early in the class that they can do better. They don't have to wait four more weeks for the next, te next test. Other things people do. Hi, this is uh, Diana Allison in interior yeah, design. And hi, um, a lot of my faculty, we were doing kind of a combo. We would do synchronous on at least one day of the week and then we would have individual chats uh, that maybe the second day, just giving them feedback. Mm -hmm. And when we were, and it was, we were doing it synchronously, trying to keep this organization um, and their schedule, you know, kind of together. And in the end, they came back and said that that really was very helpful for them to have that check-in point because it kept them engaged. I had, we had, we tend to have smaller classes mm -hmm. in our department. I think my largest one I was doing was 14 uh, that was synchronous. And for the most part, everyone would have their video on. Toward the end, there was about three who would turn off and, and that was fine. I told them though that I needed to at least see their face or see their comments 
in order for them to have uh, credit for being in class that day. And so they would make sure at least at that point to um, pop in for just a minute or two for a comment. And it, it really was a great experience this past semester with them. And most of them, of course, were doing studio projects. So it was a large project where we're, they were getting feedback bits and pieces along the way. So it was, it was really kind of nice. Okay. Other comments, questions? I did one thing with uh, students uh, kind of similar to that on a paper where uh, I met individually with them and gave them feedback on their paper and I pulled it up as the shared screen uh, where they had posted it on Blackboard and I talked them through the comments I had as we were going along and students were really, uh, really seemed to like that. We kept doing that even after the change to online. This is, this is, Hi, this is Mozilla. Okay, okay, initially, I had a problem. Who is just going to say in reference to the Zoom oh. and say that you prefer, <laughs> you know, the... Mozilla, you got something to say? Hi, yes. Uh, I was just going to say, Dr. Holland, um, in school, studies we can't require those that are military especially active duty to have the zoom camera on because of security and privacy issues so that's something also i mean that our faculty do to have to take into consideration tell me again why you can't Can require you? the um, camera on what what is the security and privacy i'm sorry um, it's with our active duty military that oh, are take okay. are that I'm, um are in okay, classes. Fine. They yeah, I missed that. Yeah, piece. First. yeah, of course. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. My connection is really bad. I apologize. Yeah. And Patsy, yeah. you were gonna okay. say Yes. Uh, initially when I first started teaching this semester, uh, the kids would come in and they didn't have the cameras on. And I required them to have the cameras on. Uh, if they didn't have the cameras on, they weren't in class. And it was really hard for me to get the classes involved, to get them to do any work. And what I did, I tried putting them in groups and they seemed to have liked that too. And it was just hard for, for me and for the students also just to get a connection. So toward the end, it, it got better. But I did require them to have the cameras on. I, uh, when I uh, work with my students, I tell them that it's my job to make them believe that they can learn accounting and learn how to do a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, I think um, I am the next one up and I'm gonna be talking about one little tool uh, that can be useful in promoting um, growth mindset. And then uh, after that, Caesar's going to show us how to take that tool online. So let's see if I can share my screen here. Um, here it is. Okay, so we're going to be talking about uh, what the literature calls a cognitive wrapper. Sometimes you've heard it as an exam, uh, an exam wrapper, but you can wrap any kind of an assignment. So the term wrapping is an analogy to like gift wrap. So you do a very simple little assignment that involves asking students to think about how they did in, in on a test, on a project, on a paper. So you wrap that little uh, metacognitive opportunity around an, an assignment they have already completed. Let's see if I can figure out how to get to, oh, there we go. So. A wrapper is, t in format, a wrapper is nothing more than a little questionnaire. Um, and it's got three parts. The first asks students specifically, what did they do? What did I do? So, um, you know, how long did they study? Uh, I have a friend who asked, do they own the book? Um, what study strategies did they use? And that, notice the bold in the word specifically. Uh, the second part of a, a wrapper is always a chunk which asks specifically, uh, where did I succeed and where did I fall short of my own expectations? 
And then the third part is, again, specifically, what will I do next time to improve? And, you know, you all know about, uh, you know, New Year's resolutions. If you say, you know, I'm going to lose weight, uh, good luck with that. If you tell your three best friends that you're going to lose three pounds by um, Valentine's Day, you might do a little bit better. Notice the, the specificity and a little bit of publicity. So three sets of questions. Let's look at um, a real f useful format for that kind of uh, thing. You typically want to do it as much as possible as a little check off checklist. Uh, so what did you do when you were studying? And give them seven, eight options. And I'm going to show you a tool where you can just cut and paste those options in. Um, what did you do? Did you reread the material? Did you read it for the first time? Did you read the lecture notes? Did you quiz yourself? Did you do practice problems, etc.? The reason for the list of options is that it can nudge students to think of things that they didn't think of as possibilities. The research on what undergraduates do to study is um, pretty overwhelming and quite sad. I, I don't know of any with uh, a graduate students, but with undergraduates, for the most part, there's a stampede to the least effective strategies. So the least effective things you can do are what we call the cognitively passive things, rereading things. And the other ineffective thing is what we call mass practice, doing it all at once at the end. And so what's more effective is spreading stuff out and doing things that ask you to solve problems, write sample essays, quiz yourself, and so on. So students typically aren't even going to think of those active things because most students don't do them. So that's a good reason to have a checklist. It also makes the whole process easier. And then it's always good to have one or two open-ended questions like, you know, something else? What else did you think of? Let's look at what one of those, uh, one section of a wrapper might look at. Uh, when did I start studying? Again, that's getting at that idea of what we call distributed practice. How long did I study? Um, and there are two issues here. Sometimes students will study a very long time in very ineffective ways and get pretty discouraged. So if I'm spending 17 hours studying for this test and all I'm doing is rereading and rereading, I'm not really studying very well. It's not going to have much impact likely and I'm going to get discouraged and I'm going to think I can't do this. The notice the rest of it is what are, which of these things did I do? And as we go through it, you're going to see that there's a mix of the passive things. I read assignments for the first time, reread assignments, read the slides, went over a review sheet, all cognitively passive. Quizzed myself from the review sheet. Oh, I did something. Wrote a sample essay. Oh, I did something. Read over completed problems. I didn't do anything. Work problems for myself. I did. Took a practice test and so on. So no, you kind of see the pattern. You want to mix it up because students typically, and for the also lower division undergraduates, overwhelmingly will not think of the cognitively active things. Um, and then you create two more uh, very similar checklists um, for uh, the other two questions. Where did I do well? Not so well. And so you ask them the kinds of items they missed, the kinds of content they missed, and so on. And then to ask them to pick up, to say one or two things they're going to do differently next time. Uh, all of this can fit on one piece of paper, one page. So how do you use a wrapper? Uh, this comes from Marsha Lovett, who is pretty much the big name in this area. So her suggestion is first, um, first test of the semester or assignment or paper or whatever, but first in your series of whatevers. So we'll say tests here. Students prepare and take the exam just as they ordinarily would. Uh, second step is to return the graded exams and the wrappers for students to complete in class. It takes about 10 minutes. Have students sign the wrapper with their name on it uh, and collect it. You might give a couple of participation points for, um, uh, you know, for doing that, uh, or you just simply want to know who did it because before they study for the next, next exam, you're going to return that wrapper to them and say, oh, remember what you said you were going to do? Try it out. 
And then as the, you know, as the shampoo bottle says, rinse and repeat. Uh, so it's really desirable if you would do that for each test or each paper, each series in something. Um, now, not everybody returns tests. There are some issues in great big classes, high stakes tests and so on. And so a variation on that, and often in those environments, what happens is a student who didn't do well is invited for a one-to-one -one conversation with the faculty member. And a wrapper can be a really good way to make that conversation more productive and to focus more on learning and less on performance, as, as Teresa was talking about. So I think we've had those conversations with students where they just go on and on and on with what was the right answer, what was the right answer, and you know, I find myself wanting to say, you're never gonna see this item again. Why don't we think about how do we get to the right answer? And so um, a wrapper can be a, a, a nice way to use, uh, to get students to think about their performance in that kind of environment. Um, and then uh, some resources. Um, the, this, uh, and I'll send this thing out. So this is a little um, a piece from Stanford's um, teaching and learning site, again, where Carol Dweck is and I think I doubt that she was involved with this, but you can certainly see the fingerprints. Um, and it's very good on implementing wrappers. Um, Carnegie Mellon is where Marsha Lover, I think was, I don't think she's there anymore, but she did a lot of the original work. And so she's got, on that site, she's got tons of examples of exam wrappers and also homework wrappers, which I thought was a real interesting kind of thing. So kind of relatively low stakes thing, but things that students need uh, to keep on. And then um, Jose Antonio uh, Bowen's uh, work, Teaching Naked, I love uh, the name of that book. He has a chapter called Cognitive Wrappers. Um, and he's got a really nice little template for a wrapper and it goes through and it gives you all kinds of specifics you could add to, you could cut and paste in to uh, creating a checklist. So let's start, with, uh, stop, pause there and see if we got any questions. And here's an example of a, I'm gonna, it's a physics post exam reflection wrapper. And uh, today I'm gonna demonstrate how you could um, use uh, Microsoft Forms to create an electronic um, wrapper so you can collect the data and you could um, easily um, review the information that you gather from your, your students. So you're gonna log into your Office 365 account, like if you were logged into your email, and here in the top left-hand side, you're gonna click on this waffle icon. You're gonna click on Microsoft Forms. And you're gonna click on New Form. Here on this title, just for time's sake, I'm just gonna copy and paste, but normally you'll go ahead and create your own wrapper. So I'm gonna... Edit, copy, edit, paste. So this is the title of the of the wrapper, and I could add these instructions, additional instructions here under the description. And then to add a new question to this Microsoft form, I click on Add New. And I could add um, multiple choice text. So the one I'm going to use is text. And just again, for time's sake, I'm just going to copy and paste this example. Edit, copy, paste. and then add new. And this is a particular, um, there's, it's a question within additional questions within, it, within, it's a question within a question. So I'm gonna choose the plus sign and then here with the arrow pointing down, I'm gonna choose a section because this is a particular, there's questions within additional questions. So I'm gonna choose section and I'm gonna name this, um, Test preparation time. I'm going 
copy, copy, edit, paint. And then I could add the additional questions here. Text. And I'll do one more, let me see. Just for demonstration purposes. Copy. So here's test preparation. Add new section. And this will be called preparation for this exam. And this is to add the section. To add the actual question, I'm going to click on Add New. And then I'm going to choose Text to add a text question. Again, there's different types of questions. There's multiple choice. You could add a text question, ratings. You could actually add date. There's the ranking, Ligurate. You could also file upload. And I've been using the section one also today. So I'm going to click Add New, the text. And I'm gonna copy this question. Hey, Caesar, Michael wanted to know if there are limits on the number of characters that you can use in different parts of the form. There, uh, like on the actual question, so yeah, not that I know of, I can do more <laughs> research on the actual, how many? Actually, it's not the question um, in the, that you're putting okay. on there, but the student's response. Because, you know, sometimes on forms, you go to enter a response, particularly if it's an open paragraph, and it you don't know there's a limit, and it cuts you short, and then you're like, okay, now how am I supposed to answer that? Yeah. Right. Michael, it looks like it's like 4,000. Okay. 4,000 characters. That's okay. Probably. Yeah, that's, that's plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> I'm gonna do two more questions so I can demonstrate to you one more time. Add new section. This is uh, estimated, uh, estimate uh, percentage of points. And this is again to add the section and then to add the actual question, add new text this is a question within the question so. okay. copy Edit pins. And I'll do one, the final number question, number five. Section the force body diagrams and applying Newton's second law. That's to add the section and then to add the new question, add new text, edit, copy, edit, paste. So this is just an example how you create a an exam wrapper. And again, just for time's sake, I was just copying and paste because then it'll take me a little bit more time to actually create this, type it all in. And then to share it with students, you just, oh, before you do that, you click on settings. Here on the top right-hand side, on the top right-hand side, there's three dots. 
you click on settings. Let me expand this so you can see the actual settings. So you go to settings here on the top right hand side, click on settings. And here, who can fill this out, this form? Anyone can, or you can specify if you just want, make sure you can find, also find out who fills this out, who fills this form out, like which students. So you can do only people in my organization, record name, one person per response. And I'm gonna choose anyone so y'all can try it also. So you can see this form. I'm gonna share this link so you can check it out but normally you choose only people in my organization if you want to record which students responded to what answer. And you could also um, add, edit all these additional settings. You could have um, options for responses, start end date, shuffle questions. Also, you can get a notification if students respond. You could also change the theme, click on this theme and change theme, you see. You could also preview this wrapper. So it says the, the questions right here, task preparation time. This is where they add the percentages. Preparation for this exam, estimated percent of points and additional questions. And once students finish, they can just click on submit. So I'm gonna click on back. And let me share the, in order, so the way you share the link with students is you click on share. Let me show you one more time. This button on the top right hand side, you click on share. And to send and collect responses, Anyone to link can respond or only people in your in the university. So I'm gonna click anyone my anyone with the link can respond. And you so uh, Caesar, if you, if we post the uh, link on Blackboard or Canvas, that will get students to this. Yes. So the, you 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 share this link within within the Blackboard, mm -hmm. or you could email it also, and then you click on copy. And then you share this link in the learning management system. Yes, correct. So you copy. And I'm going to share it in chat so you can check it out. The one I just created. Edit, paste. There's the link that I just, the, the wrapper that I just created using Microsoft Forms. And then to review, to review the responses from the student, you go to responses and all the response data will be located here. You could also um, open it in Excel, and in Excel, again, you could manipulate all the data that students um, have responded to the wrapper questions. And I hope you can try Microsoft Forms. It's a great tool that you can use to create your, your exam wrappers. Thank you very much for your time. One other question, Caesar. Is it possible to return to students before the second test their individual form or once they reply does it sort of go into the the general yeah once they hit submit it just goes to the general um responses yeah. right here that's the thing that i might then ask students if i was going to use forms i might ask them to make a note of what was their plan for next time because they are likely to forget what, if they're not promptly Qu other questions We are getting near the end of our time. So in the uh, name of shameless promotion, uh, let me remind you what's coming up next. Um, on Thursday, which is tomorrow, Tracy Edmonds and uh, someone else from the library whose name is escaping me right now will be talking about online educational resources. So those are some of the things that are available free to students. Um, there are some fine things out there. There's a uh, we are in fact using an OER for the uh, course text in the um, online course in, in the Flipped Academy. Uh, so if you want to learn about OERs, Tracy has a real passion for that and she's quite knowledgeable. Uh, and then on Friday, uh, it will be round two of accessibility. So opportunity to learn some more of the tools that Incarnate Word has to increase um, 
the accessibility of course materials, making them available and usable for people with all kinds of different backgrounds. So again, thank you all very much for joining us today. It's been great to see you all.